Joining me here this evening is Professor Brian Cox, who is the 2010 Voltaire Lecturer, following in such illustrious footsteps as Michael Foote, Richard Dawkins, Ludovic Kennedy. Brian, what are you going to be talking to us about this evening? <laughs> A list to make me nervous. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to talk about the, um, the, the beauty and power of science, but really from two starting points. One is that I think that it's economically undervalued. Um, so in a, you know, times of difficulty, economic difficulty like this, then there's a, there's a tendency for all political parties to think that scientific research and exploration is a luxury and is something that you can just do in the good times. And I want to refute that. But also I think linked is the, the, the feeling amongst many people that science is, is not sufficient in its delivery of wonder, let's say. So it doesn't satiate the human desire for wonder and therefore you need something else as well. You know, to, I think many people just feel that science is a clinical pursuit and, and there needs to be something else in the universe to you know, make us happy. <laughs> and, uh, so, and I think they're linked because they both undervalue, in my view, the real, um, well, undervalue the value <laughs> of science. Is the feeling of wonder what got you involved in science in the first place? Well, yeah, I mean, I was uh, particularly, it was astronomy for me from the, as far back as I can remember which actually may have been related to the Apollo moon landings, because although, I mean, I was born in 68, so I don't actually remember them, but I'm told I was there at the time. <laughs> I sat there watching on TV, and I was in that, that kind of house where there were pictures of, you know, eagle on the, on the, on the wall and Apollo 11, and there were, there were newspaper cuttings of Apollo mm. 13. And, you know, so, so I grew up in that atmosphere. So I think that, that sense of the excitement of exploration, mm. coupled with the just what every kid knows that the night sky is yeah. beautiful, I think, set me off on that path. What, are, there, are there the same sort of, I mean, I don't follow this particularly, but are there the same sort of discoveries happening today that would inspire children in that same way, with the same feeling? I think that they may well be, actually, now. I mean, we're, we're in a, a very interesting time in space exploration. I mean, we've discovered liquid water on many worlds for the, for the first time, particularly Europa, the moon, the moon of Jupiter. But also on Mars now, we're getting to, we, we've found ice all over the place, but we're beginning to see hints that there may be some signs, maybe some signs of microbes, possibly on the surface of Mars. There are interesting measurements of methane, actually, in the atmosphere that seems to be seasonal, seasonally varying, and there's very little ge geological activity on Mars, we think. So that could be from a biological source. It's you know, tantalizing uh, evidence. So, so we've got the, the rover's opportunity and spirit on the surface of Mars now still alive. One, mm -hmm. I think, opportunity is slightly more alive than spirit at the moment. So it's a real golden age of exploration in that sense. And also we've got the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, which has captured the imagination like no other, no experiment for decades, I think, because we actually do market research on why it's captured the imagination, right. actually. And amongst kids, it's this idea of going back towards the Big Bang, you know, the fact that you can recreate the conditions that were present less than a billionth of a second after the universe began and, and explore it in some detail just captures the imagination. That's pretty inspiring stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Polly. And, and uh, I'd like to thank the British Humanist Association uh, for inviting me to give the Voltaire. Is that working? The Voltaire lecture. There we go. I'll thank, I'll thank them again. There we go. Uh, I mean, you, you heard from the, the list of previous Voltaire lectures that it is indeed a, 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 a real honour. So thank you for that honour. Um, I want to talk really, well, I want to talk about the majesty and beauty of the universe um, with some physics thrown in. But I think there are, there are two real points I want to make, two, two real ideas I want to base this lecture on, and, and they're both related. The, the first is that I think that in our difficult economic times, so now in a recession, you see all political parties, I think, undervalue the, 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 well, the power and the contribution that scientific research, that engineering and exploration can, can, can deliver to our economy. Um, you see that we talk about science cuts, we don't talk about rises in science funding at the moment. There's also, I think, a sense out there in the general population, not in this hall, I hope, but in the general population, that um, science fails to deliver everything you need as a human being. So the, 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 the science is rather clinical, perhaps, and that this, this project that we're involved in, in exploring and trying to understand the universe is... is it doesn't satiate humans' desire for, for wonder. There's something emotionally lacking, and therefore you need to fill the, 
the, the voids, I suppose. You need to fill the unknown with something else, something imaginary that gives you that, that I suppose, emotional reaction that you need to the universe. I, I think they're linked because both those problems we have today, lack of investment and a lack of understanding of the sheer beauty of the universe as revealed by science, are based on a, just a simple misunderstanding of what the scientific endeavour is and, and a misunderstanding and a lack of knowledge actually of the beautiful vision and, well, the, the beauty of the universe as revealed by science. And I thought a good place to start because I, I can't say it better than this chap. I know many of you will know Richard Feynman. This is one of his books, What Do You Care What Other People Think? And in the first page of the first chapter, I think he expresses beautifully um, why the view that you need something else other than science to, to give you that connection to the universe is, 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 well, wrong. What he says was, I have a friend who's an artist, and he sometimes takes a view which I don't agree with, which is typical find in the first page of his book. He'll hold up a flower and say, look how beautiful it is, and I'll agree. But then he'll say, I, as an artist, can see how beautiful a flower is, but you, as a scientist, take it all apart and it becomes dull. I think he's kind of nutty, that's <laughs> real Feynman. First of all, the beauty that he sees is available to other people, and to me too, I believe. Although I might not be quite as refined aesthetically as he is, I can appreciate the beauty of a flower. But at the same time, I see much more in the flower than he sees. I can imagine the cells inside, which also have a beauty. There's beauty not just at the dimension of one centimetre, there's also beauty at smaller distances. There are the complicated actions of the cells and other processes. The fact that colours in the flower have evolved in order to attract insects, to pollinate it, is interesting. That means insects can see colours. That adds a question. Does this aesthetic sense we have also exist in lower forms of life? There are all kinds of interesting questions that come from a knowledge of science, which only adds to the excitement and mystery and awe of a flower. It only adds. I don't understand how it subtracts. Uh, absolutely right, of course. Look at this picture. Um, in fact, I'm gonna, can you drop the lights a bit? Because I'm going I'm to drop this. I know how to drop the lights. They told me, so I can do that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Just so you can see this beautiful picture that's been there. This is a galaxy. It's a fairly common or garden galaxy, although it is indeed a beautiful galaxy. It's called a Sombrero galaxy. It's about 30 million light years from Earth. That means the light has taken 30 million years, travelling 186,000 miles a second, to make its journey from that galaxy to our telescopes. It's beautiful, but think about this. There are 200 billion suns in that galaxy, we now know. 200,000 million stars like our sun. We've also, over the last 10 years or so, begun to detect planets around other stars. And now I think it's fair to say that we expect that most stars, or at least many stars, will have planetary systems around them. So in that faint, beautiful glow, there are 200 billion suns with perhaps billions and billions of planets around them. In the centre of that galaxy, we've detected a black hole, by the way, that the stars orbit around the centre, which is one billion times the mass of the sun. Right? So this is a point-like collapsed object, which is so powerful gravitationally that light cannot escape from it, a billion times the mass of the sun in the centre of that galaxy. As Feynman says, I don't see how extra information about that picture makes it less beautiful. Or pictures of the night sky. I mean, this is a, if you, there's astronomers amongst you, you'll just re realize that that's the constellation of Orion, but that's not the interesting thing about this bit of the night sky. The interesting thing is a piece of sky around here, which is almost completely black from the, sun, from the surface of the Earth. And it's actually a piece of sky that you would cover if you took a uh, five pence piece and held it 75 feet away. So we're zooming into that piece of sky now. So five pence piece, 75 feet away. You cover the tiniest bit of sky, no stars in it all visible from the surface of the Earth. But the Hubble Space Telescope took a picture of that piece of sky, a very famous picture. Um, it opened its camera for thousands and thousands of seconds and just focused in on the blackness. And it took this picture, which is one of the most famous, if not the most famous pictures in astronomy. It's called the Hubble Deep Field Image. 
If you haven't seen it, it's remarkable because there are only about three stars in our galaxy in this picture. Every other point of light, and there are 10,000 points of light in that picture, is a galaxy with an average 100 billion stars like our sun. The most distant, which are the reddest, because they recede in a way from us faster and faster and faster, are something like 12 billion light years away. So, well, let me qualify that. The light took 12 billion years to journey from those galaxies to the Earth. But since the light began its journey and traversed those depth of space, space has been stretching. So actually now, in some sense, those galaxies are 46 billion light years away. That's the edge of the observable universe. 10,000 galaxies in that tiny piece of sky. When you extend that over the entire sky, we think there are 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe now, each with an average 100 billion stars like our sun. So we've, <laughs> the universe is big. <laughs> <laughs> so, and quite astonishingly beautiful. Again, as Feynman said, it's a beautiful picture. I mean, you can see the structure. You can see spiral galaxies and globular galaxies and irregular galaxies. But when you know, when, when you do science on it and see the facts and understand what it's showing, it becomes all the more beautiful. How can we begin to learn that? I mean, how can we begin to question what that's made of, where did it come from, you know, how on earth could you understand it? Well, this is a picture of the Big Bang, um, or the evolution of the universe. So from quite precise measurements, and I'll talk a little bit, a little bit later on about how beautiful those measurements are, we now think the universe began about 13.7 billion years ago and has been expanding and cooling ever since. And if you look at the universe today, the Hubble Deep Field image, the picture of galaxies, or just look around you at planets and stars and complex objects like people, civilizations. You see a bewilderingly complicated universe. But what we found is that that complexity is really a property of an old and cold universe. Right? So in a sense, that complexity has crystallized out as the universe has expanded and cooled. As you go back in time towards the Big Bang, so you get back well to a billionth of a second after the Big Bang or less, then we found through experiment that the universe is extremely simple. So one way of understanding that complexity, uh, what all those billions of stars and galaxies and people, plants and planets are made of, is to go back in time and recreate those conditions that were present less than a billionth of a second after the Big Bang and look. Now, of course, you can't build time machines, but you can build machines like this, which is the Large Hadron Collider, which is the place I work when I'm not messing around <laughs> making TV programs. Um, and its job is to recreate those conditions, the earliest conditions we can, in order to reveal the underlying simplicity of the universe, because we can understand it back then. I suppose a good analogy, which I like a lot, is to imagine a snowflake in your hand, which is an incredibly complex and, and beautiful thing. You know, every snowflake you look at is different. But as your hand heats it up, as you heat the snowflake up, then it melts, and you will see that there's just a pool of water left in your hand. In other words, the structure, the simplicity of the snowflake is H2O, it's water, it's nothing more than that. But as you cool it down, that complex structure crystallizes out and in some sense obscures the underlying simplicity and beauty. That's the same, in, in that very similar way, that's what we want to do at the LHC. We recreate the conditions less than a billion per second after the Big Bang to see the underlying simplicity. We do that by taking protons, so nuclei of hydrogen, and we accelerate them around this 27 kilometer long or 27 kilometer in circumference machine to 99.999999% of the speed of light. That means that they go around that machine 11,000 times a second and there are two beams, one going one way and one going the other way, and we collide them at four points around that ring. I mean, just to get a sense of scale, even if you needed it, that's Geneva Airport runway there. So there's the airport, and here's our experiment, which is bigger than the airport. Um, this is a picture of the inside of the LHC, just before it was finished, actually, so, because it's an immense engineering achievement. Um, those beams of protons, um, circulate inside the, these two things here called beam pipes. There's an incredibly high vacuum in there. And the beams, when 
that they vary in size, but when we cross them, when we collide them, then they're about the diameter of a human hair, perhaps a bit smaller than that, but they carry the energy of an aircraft carrier going at 30 miles an hour, compressed into that space, and we cross them together. We can collide at full power 600 million protons together every second. So we can make 600 million mini, mini big bangs, if you like, every second with this machine. The whole thing is at minus 271 degrees Celsius, which is about 1.9 degrees above absolute zero. And that's so the magnets which bend these particles around in a circle can work um, at all, actually. Um, just for those of you that are techie geeks or engineering kind of people, um, these wires here carry a current of 13,000 amps when the machine is at full power. And you can see that they're almost like fuse wire. And the reason they can do that is because at these temperatures, that wire, which is a niobium tin, niobium tin, yes, niobium tin alloy, or is it niobium titanium? It might be niobium titanium. <laughs> Some, can anyone tell me? I think it's niobium titanium, actually. At that temperature, um, those wires are what's called superconducting, which means they have no electrical resistance. And so those wires can carry 13,000 amps of current to the magnets and still be almost as thin as fuse wire. We collide those beams together inside of four detectors. Um, this is the detector that I work on. It's called the ATLAS experiment. Um, there's a standard European person there, <laughs> e <laughs> EU standard size, one point whatever meters. Uh, so you can get some sense of scale. Um, the protons collide in the middle there. And each layer of this detector is optimized to detect a different kind of particle. So, for example, uh, this piece here can detect, uh, well, this is silicon, actually, which is a bit like the CCDs and dig digital camera, which can detect charged particles as they come out. Uh, these blue bits detect particles called muons that I'll describe in a moment. But the whole thing is really designed to detect anything that you create in those collisions and piece it back together so you can literally take a picture of the universe as it was at the temperature it was a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. Um, this is a very famous picture you've seen, I, I suspect, on many newspapers of the Atlas detector during construction. There's a real Frenchman there. And uh, these are those grey pieces you perhaps saw in the last picture, which are actually magnets. And it's in the centre of there that the collisions happen. And this is, a, a, to me, a beautiful picture um, for many reasons. It was taken on the 30th of March so about a week ago, and it's a picture of a collision at the LHC because the LHC is running beautifully now. In fact, it ran, it had its most successful uh, colliding runs over the Easter weekend. This is a collision at an energy of what we call 7 TV, which is about half the design power of LHC, but it's three and a half times the energy that we've had before at the world's highest energy collider in Chicago. So it's one of the highest, well, the highest energy collision ever seen. Um, this is where the collision happened, of course, and you see all the new particles that have been made by that vast amount of energy. The LHC will now run for 18 months to two years in this mode, collecting data, and may make profound discoveries. It will make discoveries um, in that 18 month to two year run. Um, whether they're discoveries like the Higgs particle that I'll talk about in a moment, nobody knows. But already there are scientific papers being prepared on the data we've uh, accumulated actually over the Easter weekend. And as I say, we'll run uninterrupted if there are no problems for 18 months to two years. So why are we doing that? You know, what is it about the, the, the nature that we don't understand specifically that we need the LHC to tell us? Well, on the eve of the LHC, so now, um, as the LHC turns on and starts taking data, this is what we know the universe is made of. Right, so everything that I showed in the Hubble Deep Field image, that you and me, every star, every planet, every galaxy, is made actually of just these four particles, the fundamental building blocks of nature. That one is perhaps the most familiar, the particle called the electron, the particle of electricity. And these two, the up and down quarks, make up protons and neutrons. So you need two ups and a down to make a proton, two downs and an up to make a neutron. That makes the atomic nucleus of every atom in your body, the electrons go around there, and you make molecules, you make complex things like DNA, and eventually stars and people. You need those three. They're held together by four forces of nature, so we know of four forces. One of them, gravity, I'm not going to mention very much in this talk, because it's so astonishingly weak that it has no uh, 
well, no bearing at all on the, on the physics we see in particle collisions. I mean, you may say that gravity doesn't feel very weak if you fall off a ladder, of course, <laughs> down to ground, pulls you to the ground. But it is true that, well, there's a planet trying to lift, trying to pull that bottle of water down, planet Earth, right? and I can just resist its force and lift it up. It's something like, well, less than a billion, 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 billion times weaker than the other forces of nature. Um, why that is, is one of the great mysteries, but it means that as far as particle physics is concerned, we have no way of detecting its presence, and so we leave it out of our model. Everything else, though, that happens in the universe, everything else that happens in nature, is in principle um, shown in that tiny periodic table-like plot of the subatomic particles. So these blue ones represent the other three forces of nature. This one is a photon, a particle of light, now, in particle physics, in quantum mechanics, the picture of the force of electromagnetism, so the force that keeps the electrically charged electrons around the electrically charged nucleus, is carried by the photon. So you can really picture it as an electron exchanging a photon with the quarks inside the atomic nucleus, and that exchange of the photon uh, is, is the, what gives rise to the electromagnetic force that keeps the electrons in orbit. Similarly, there's a force called the strong nuclear force, which sticks the quarks together inside the nuclei, sticks the protons and neutrons together inside the atomic nucleus, and that's carried by these things, the unimaginatively named gluon. Um, <laughs> and then there's these two, which carry something called the weak nuclear force. Now, the weak force is a bit esoteric, because it doesn't hold electrons in orbit, it doesn't stick the nucleus together. The best way I know of explaining it is to and an excuse to show a beautiful picture is to look at our sun. So this is a, a real video of our star. Astonishing in so many ways, you can fit a million Earths inside that. So it sits there 93 million miles away, uh, the size of a million Earths. It shines by burning hydrogen into helium. So it takes protons, the nuclei of hydrogen, and it crushes them together and converts them into helium, which are two protons and two neutrons. It does that, by the way. It converts 600 million tons of hydrogen into helium every second. 600 million tons a second. Imagine how many protons you need to turn into neutrons to convert 600 million tons of hydrogen into 596 million tons of helium. Four million tons goes missing as E equals mc squared, which is the energy that we see, sunshine, essentially. To turn a proton into a neutron, you need a force, because you need a force to do everything in nature, and that force is the weak nuclear force. So it converts protons to neutrons inside the sun, and therefore allows the sun to shine. Every time it does that, it emits one of these things, which is called the neutrino, the fourth of my four fundamental particles. Now, as I said, 600 million tons of hydrogen is a lot of protons. So, Imagine how many of those neutrinos come streaming out of the sun every second. One way you can do that is to look at your thumbnail now, because your thumbnail is about, what, a centimetre square. There are 60 billion neutrinos per centimetre squared per second going through the Earth from the sun. 60 billion going through your thumbnail every second, even though the sun is 93 million miles away. That gives you a sense, I think, of <laughs> the hard job that the weak nuclear force is doing. Um, Without it, we wouldn't be here. So that's these four. It is true to say that these four particles appear to be everything you need to build a universe with the four forces of nature, those three plus gravity. But for some reason, and we have no idea why, nature has seemed to make two carbon copies of those four particles of nature. We discovered them by experiment. We had no idea that they were going to be there. Actually, no idea in a very real sense. That's called the strange quark. Because really, someone said, that's strange. <laughs> and this one, actually, called a muon. Famously, someone said, who ordered that? It was Fermi. He said, who ordered that? When that turned up. Um, so nature has made two carbon copies. They're identical in every way to these particles you need to build a person or a planet or a star, except they're heavier. So the muon is the same as an electron, except it's heavier. The tau, the same as the electron. The muon, it's heavier. Same for the quarks, same for the neutrinos. We're fairly sure, very sure, that there aren't any more because of experiments we did at CERN throughout the 1980s and 1990s. Um, but the reason nature has chosen to do that is uh, obscure. We really don't know why. Um, 
What it reminds me of is a, a periodic table, as I mentioned before. You know, Mendeleev, back in the, in the mid-19th century, used the pattern in the chemical elements to really begin to understand atomic structure. So there is a deep reason why you see patterns like that in nature, and there will be a deep reason why nature has chosen that pattern. But we have no idea why it is. It's fascinating. So what I've done there is what, um, well, Ernest Rutherford, one of the fathers of modern particle physics, uh, a fellow academic in Manchester back at the turn of the 20th century, Ernest Rutherford said that all science is either physics or stamp collecting. Right? <laughs> which um, was an in, probably meant to be an insult. He was a gruff New Zealander by all accounts. He then was given the Nobel Prize for chemistry. <laughs> which, <laughs> um, but um, he had a, the point he was trying to make was not really to insult other sciences, I don't think. It was to say that that's very well and good, but we've stamp collected. We've done experiments, we've discovered particles, we've made a pattern of them. What you need then is a theory. You need a mathematical theory, you need some kind of picture, some understanding of the structure, of the interactions of the particles with the forces. And we have one. And I'm going to show it now. It's, it's, it's simple and beautiful. It's written in rather obscure notation, perhaps. But the thing to understand when you see it is that it describes everything we know of in nature other than gravity. So it describes why the sky's blue, why the sun shines. It describes, in principle, if you add complex enough computers, as far as we know, the structure of all atoms, the structure of molecules, the structure of DNA. Everything we know about everything other than gravity contained in one equation. That's it. And occasionally, you get a laugh when you say it's simple. But remember that I, it really does describe everything we know of in the universe other than gravity. And it's not, it's not too difficult, actually, to, to see what's going on. In it, these things here, these Greek letter size, represent all the particles, all the matter particles in the standard model. So the electrons, the muons, the quarks, they're all sat in here. And the forces are represented by these things. So there's the gluons, and actually the photons and the, the W and Z particles, the weak and the electromagnetic force, are mixed up inside these two bits. Um, and they're repeated here. So, for example, if you want a particle in here to interact with another particle over there, with the strong nuclear force, then here's the bit that tells you how it happens. Here are the gluons, and they tell you how the particles talk to each other. And the same for the photons and the Ws and the Zs. So it's a very beautiful equation. I want to just read you something, because it's funny primarily, but it leads me nicely into a description of that equation. As you might know, if any of you are on Twitter, you'll see that I got in the shit with a load of astrologers. In, <laughs> in a, <laughs> for simply saying that astronomy is rubbish on the BBC. And I got lots of letters, but this is one of them. And it really does actually lead me into a point I want to make about that. It says, well, this is a funny bit. It says, astrology has a spiritual psychological framework which has previously defied explanation, but science heads into ever more wondrous territory. Jungian synchronicity and ancient law become ever more comprehensible. Although science hasn't realized this yet. <laughs> <laughs> Then he goes, for instance, the Dark Lord Pluto and his mythical invisible underworld is a beautiful metaphor for the dimensions of dark matter and energy. And the dwarf planet even symbolizes the LHC. It says, I don't know. What. But, um, but it then goes on to discuss something that you hear a lot in, in pseudoscience, which is that, well, quantum mechanics somehow tells us that everything's interconnected. And so, therefore, the movements of Jupiter across the fixed stars can affect us on Earth. You know, it's this statement that quantum mechanics is means everything in the universe is connected to everything else somehow leads as a, as a springboard to a lot of bullshit. But, <laughs> but actually, the wonderful thing is it's true, right? It, it, is, it is wonderfully true. And this is the, I think this is the hardest bit in the lecture, so I apologise. It's only about a minute long. But I thought because you're an educated audience, I know, I wanted to try and explain this because it, to me it's one of the most beautiful and startling things in nature. And it's to do with the fact that everything's connected. You see, that theory, the standard model, is what's called a quantum field theory. So every particle has a field. So the electron has a field. But there is only one electron field in the universe, right? The electron field, that's it, this. And it has a value at every point in space and time. But it's one field. So in a very deep sense, every electron is connected to everything else. Every electron knows in some very subtle way that really is difficult to see, but you can see it. Um, 
that what every other electron is doing, right? So that's correct, the astrologer is correct. But it's very subtle and very beautiful. It's connected through something called, or one of the ways that connected is through something called local gauge invariance. And I'd like to take one minute to tell you what it is, because it's stunning. If there are mathematicians, you'll be able to see what's going on already. But anyway, so this electron field, basically you can imagine it as just a value at every point in space and time, which is associated with electrons. And, and the bigger the value of the field, the more likely it is you'll find an electron there. You can think of it like that. But there's an extra piece, mathematically, in the electron field, which is represented by this thing, and it's called a phase. Right? And for electrons, that phase is really like a clock hand, so the hand on the face of a clock. And you can just turn it through 360 degrees. So every point in the electron field, you've got this, you could call it an internal degree of freedom, like a little clock face, and you can put it anywhere you want. Now, it's been known for many years, decades and decades, that for particles, no observable consequences can be seen uh, as a result of where those little clock hands point. Right? So they're kind of something that seems redundant in nature. It doesn't matter where you put the clock hands. Everything you can measure about the electron, um, it just doesn't care where that point happens. The trouble is that if you just write down a theory of electrons st standing still, so you don't do anything else, you just write down the theory of the electron field. That's the top line there. It does depend, and you, you, if you don't know a bit of maths, you could see it, but it does depend on where those little clock hands point if you try and change them at every point in space and time independently. Right? So let's say there's a value of the electron field there, and there's a value of it there, and there, and there. Although there are no observable consequences, if you just write the simplest theory you can down and then move all the little hands to different places, then the equations don't stay the same. Right? It's broken, it doesn't work. That's called the local gauge symmetry, right? And the, the equation for the electron on its own, the simplest one you can write down, doesn't respect it, right? It cares. What was done about 40 or 50 years ago now and forms the basis of the standard model is some mathematicians, out of curiosity basically, said, well, what's the simplest thing I can do to fix that equation to respect local gauge invariance, right? So I want to put some maths in there simply to allow me to move these little clock hands around every point in space and make no difference. And you can do it, right? And it looks like it's a massive additional bit of complexity. But believe me, if you don't want to check, <laughs> that that put into there leaves this the same, so-called invariance, right? But here's the remarkable thing. This is how everything's connected. This bit that you added on is exactly the equation for a photon. So what actually happens is that you invent electromagnetism and you invent it precisely and exactly. That is the equation for electrons interacting by the exchange of photons. So the electromagnetic force in this language is a consequence of imposing what's called local gauge invariance on the equation for an electron. And in fact, three of the four forces of nature, and many people think gravity should be the same, but we haven't been able to do it yet, um, originates from imposing these so-called local gauge invariances on these fields that span the universe. So I think that's, I, that's the hard bit over with, but I, I hope you get some sort of flavour for the, the power and beauty of the, well, the aesthetic power of mathematics, because that's an aesthetic choice and it's rather abstract, but it turns out to lead to a much deeper understanding of the origin of the forces of nature. So, I don't think the astrologer meant that, but, <laughs> <laughs> but they're right. <laughs> That's one thing about the standard model. So the standard model is invariant under a series of local gauge transformations. That forces the form of it, and that form describes three of the four forces of nature beautifully. But there's still a problem in here. <laughs> and I could say, can you see what it is? Like so <laughs> Rolf Harris like. But um, it's actually uh, these two bits here, because this symbol, this phi, is a particle, but it's not in the, the Mendeleev plot, if you want, my periodic table of the fundamental particles, because that's the Higgs particle, and I'd not put a Higgs particle in there because it's not been discovered yet. However, in the standard model, it is necessary to have all this stuff. 
Otherwise, again, the mathematics doesn't work. So in very much the same sense that we imposed local gauge invariance and got the forces, um, we've had to introduce this actually again to respect those beautiful symmetries, that invariance that we like so much. What does it do? Well, it actually gives masses to all the particles in the standard model that need mass. So what was found very early on when all this beautiful mathematical machinery was put together was that if you just put masses in by hand, so you measure the mass of the electron, you know it's got mass, you stick it in. You measure the mass particularly of the W and Z particles which carry the weak nuclear force and you put them in by hand, you find that the mass breaks down. In fact, you break those beautiful gauge invariances. So a way was found, looked for and found by Peter Higgs, a Scottish physicist who's still in Edinburgh, hopefully waiting for his Nobel Prize from the LHC. Uh, a way was found simply of adding masses in without breaking the mathematical symmetries, and it's by introducing Higgs particles. Now, there are a lot of beautiful analogies for how Higgs particles work, uh, not least because this is a true story, actually, back in the 1980s. The Conservative government, it was William Waldegrave, actually, science minister at the time, issued a challenge which he claims was a challenge that, if not met, would mean that funding for CERN would be withdrawn <laughs> and the UK wouldn't build the LHC. He said, um, if you can't explain to me within, uh, well, on one sheet of A4 in language even a politician can understand what this Higgs particle does, then we will withdraw from CERN. <laughs> and so a competition was run, won, and this is the very good analogy, actually, that won the competition. Um, the picture is that the universe is full of a Higgs field, so it's another field in the universe, just like the electron field and the quark fields, um, represented here by these Conservative Party members milling around at a cocktail party. So you can imagine every point in space, that outside you and inside you, are these, this field represented by Conservative Party members. And, um, <laughs> It's quite a, that's a good thought or not. <laughs> then imagine someone who doesn't know anyone, who is not very famous and not of interest to these people, wanders into the room, then everybody ignores them and that person can pass through the room unimpeded. That is the analogy for a massless particle, so a photon, which has no mass at all, a particle of light, that moves through the Higgs field, does not interact with the Higgs field, and therefore remains massless. Then imagine someone very important and uh, wise walks into the room, then everybody crowds around them, they, they interact with that important person. And really, in a very real sense, their path through the room is slowed down, right, because they're surrounded by people. In that same way, a massive particle interacts with the Higgs field. You could almost think of it as being surrounded by virtual Higgs particles. That slows it down, it weighs it down. That it, that the mass of the particle comes from the interaction with the Higgs field. That magically, that rather convoluted sounding mechanism preserves all the beauty and the mathematical structure and the gauge symmetries of the standard model whilst allowing you to introduce masses. And it makes a prediction, which is a key thing. It predicts that these things, the Higgs particles, will be found at the Large Hadron Collider. Right? They have to be found. There's an upper limit on the masses of those particles and the LHC has enough energy to make them. So either that's true, and we will see pictures like this, that's a simulated Higgs particle being created and then decaying in one of the detectors with this beautiful signature. Either that's true, or whatever mechanism nature has chosen to generate mass in the universe will turn up at the LHC. We know that because the standard model breaks down within the energy reach of the LHC if you remove the Higgs particles. So that's one of the key reasons why the LHC is an important machine. Because, you see, it's not just a machine that's been built to search for some arbitrary particle. That particle is fundamental to our understanding of three of the four forces of nature. It's fundamental to the standard model. So whatever mechanism nature chooses to generate mass is of fundamental importance, and we will see it. Now, there's been, I could say, two controversies about the LHC. One I just want to deal with in one page. The other one is the, the funding issue that I alluded to at the start of the lecture. There is a controversy, of course, that the LHC might destroy the world. Um, I like that headline <laughs> from, from Gizmodo. Turn to morons, LHC won't destroy it. That's basically my view. Um, it's fair to say that we've not been as 
good as we should have been at perhaps communicating this. James Gillis is the press officer, senior press officer at CERN. By way of reassurance, he pointed out the planet hasn't been destroyed yet. <laughs> so probably had a deep laugh when he <laughs> uh, A friend of mine, Greg Landsberg, <laughs> and then there was my unfortunate comment to the Radio Times. <laughs> <laughs> True, <laughs> but <laughs> more important though, that I think a more, not a difficult criticism, but a, a less ridiculous criticism is the cost. And this is a, it's Polly's fault in a way, this slide, I took it out of the Guardian. It's not the best slide in the world, but it is wonderful because it's a picture of public spending. I just want to talk for a minute about the cost of science and the cost of the LHC. So this is the, two, the 2008-9 public spending bill, 620 billion. Um, it also shows the percentage increase actually every year. And I love that, that red blob there says Her Majesty's Treasury, 109 billion up 49,891% on the previous year. It's a 50,000 percent increase in treasury funding. Of course, that's the bank bailout, the financial stability. Uh, but the interesting thing about this is you can place spot the science budget on it. Um, and unless you've seen it, it will be very difficult to spot it, because it's in that, it's in that blob up there, that sort of orange blob at the top. And it's one of the blobs surrounding the orange blob. Um, it's actually I'll bl blow it up there it is. It was in the Department of Innovation, Universities and Skills before Peter Mandelson amalgamated most of it into biz. Um, and it's their research councils, 3.3 billion. So that's the money that we spend on all research and universities on everything. So particle physics, space exploration, medical science, engineering, arts and humanities, every bit of research that's done <coughs> directly funded by government in universities is funded out of 3.2 billion, 3.3 billion. So when we're talking about the science budgets and the expense of CERN or the European Space Agency or the Medical Research Council, etc., remember that it's part of 3.3 billion, the tiniest amount of public spending, which is one of the interesting things, I think, to me, when, when we talk about cutting the science budget because it feels rather luxurious in these times. Seems to me that cutting 3.3 billion is not going to make much dent on the debt. <laughs> but as I'm going to argue, I think it might make a big dent on the debt um, for other reasons. This is an interesting plot. And I'm just going to give a couple of examples of funding and then get back to the wonder of the universe. By this is a particular <laughs> annoyance of mine. This is the uh, are we underfunding our future? This is the civil budget R&D spend as a percentage of GDP. So this is everything that we spend on R&D uh, in the economy. Um, government spend. Um, and 1% is the biggest in the world, or was, which is Iceland in 2009. It's probably 1% of not much. I don't know. <laughs> Iceland, Finland, Spain, Korea, Denmark, Portugal, Germany, Switzerland, Sweden, Netherlands, Austria, Japan, Norway, Italy, the EU average, Belgium, Czech Republic, New Zealand, Ireland, Canada, France, Australia, total OECD, United Kingdom. <laughs> right? So it's about, what, 0.45% of GDP, a long way down the lead table. I actually showed this to Lord Drayson, the science minister, uh, and he said, no, it's, well, it's out of date. It's, you're misrepresenting us. And I said, well, no, it's the 2009 OECD figures. It's not really out of date, is it? And he said, no, because it's the percentage as a function of GDP, the percentage of GDP, and we've ring-fenced the science budget, but we've reduced GDP. <laughs> <laughs> He honestly said that. So he's probably, he probably, probably has moved up but, uh, for the wrong reason. Um, it's often said, however, that we were, I was talking about with Polly earlier that um, Labour has been reasonably good for spending on science in a sense. But the blue line here is just interesting to see. This is the R&D expenditure as a share of gross domestic product from 1970 all the way to 2007-8. And the blue line is the spend, the government spend, and you see that it's essentially dropped um, from something like 1.4% of GDP in the, in the 1970s. Um, it, was, it dropped throughout the Thatcher era, dropped all the way through the major era. Labour's achievement has been to level off that fall, which is not to be sniffed at, but it's not in any way an increase in science spending. It's just arrested the fall uh, around this kind of level. Um, the, the red line is interesting because the Tories, you'll often hear them say that 
Um, there's a theory that public spending can crowd out private spending. So if you didn't use government money to do it, then somebody else would do it. This shows that's in error, because actually business spend on R&D follows public spend on R&D. And that's not too difficult to understand, really. If you've got strong universities, you get strong businesses invested in research. Um, just having said that, we're very good at science in the UK. I don't want to make it sound, although we spend very little compared to most other comp competing countries, uh, we have 1% of the population, 3% of the funding, 8% of the papers, 11.8% of world citations, and 14.4% of the highest cited papers in the world. So we are, by any measure, second only to the United States. We're essentially world leading in science and yet we invest less than pretty much every other competing country. And one last thing to note, if you don't think it's particularly important, these lines are the, what we call the knowledge intensive services, the, the, the fraction of GVA, which is essentially GDP, but with raw materials taken out. So the contribution to the economy, the percentage contribution to the value in our economy uh, as we go through to 2006. Look at that, in 2006, knowledge intensive services so these are services, parts of the economy that rely on our universities, rely on investment in research and development, contribute 40% of the money in our economy that we earn. Right Now compare that to what, 8% in finance. And remember that we invest £3.2 billion pounds a year in R&D, in science, and I would argue that it generates that. That's in UK, Germany, France and USA, they're all the same. So I think it's valuable. So <laughs> that... Essentially, you could argue that, well, what we should do is focus it a little bit better, right? That, that's often said. You'll hear Labour say it, you'll say the Tories say it. You don't hear the Lib Dems say it too much, because Evan Harris is wonderful. But anyway, <laughs> I think it's easy to refute that. Um, the World Wide Web is a very good example, actually. If you're looking at value that's generated from investment in science, CERN's most valuable contribution to the world economy has been the World Wide Web. Tim Berners-Lee said, well, you can see there, a place like CERN, where enthusiastic experts congregate from all over the world, creates a unique, innovative atmosphere in which the boundaries of technology are pushed as a matter of course. CERN's existence was critical to the start of the web. Now, the web underpins e-commerce. It underpins, I don't know how much, of global GDP. And uh, Tim Berners-Lee is making the argument, he's made it many times, that you need places like CERN, where you're free to do research, the challenges are great, and therefore innovation happens, and you produce things like the World Wide Web as a spin-off. Um, this is a great example of what he meant. He, he, he gave me this, actually, and it's now on the CERN website. It's his original proposal for the World Wide Web. And you cannot imagine this happening in a company or a, a, a tightly overseen uh, organization because he gave this to his manager who looked at it wrote vague but exciting on the top <laughs> <laughs> and, and, threw, and threw it back at him but to his credit said but you know this is uh, you carry on i kind of trust you and tim berners lee revolutionized the way that we do business in the 21st century as a result just one more example because i think it's funny i, I found it the other day actually it's this quote Alexander Fleming, when I woke up just after the dawn on September the 28th, 1928, I certainly didn't plan to revolutionise all medicine by discovering the world's first antibiotic. <laughs> <laughs> if ever there's been a reputation of directed research, it must be that one. Anyway, um, so I think the economic case, I started the lecture with saying that I think that not investing in science is, is, is a fool's game, essentially, for a modern economy. I hope I've convinced you a little bit that we're perhaps fools a little bit in the UK at the moment, although we're doing very well out of it. Um, the other part of what I said at the start was the, the emotional impact of science, right? The fact that, that it, it's often seen that science is rather clinical and you need something else. You need something else to fill those unknown spaces. I think that the best way to refute that is to tell this quite wonderful story. I've shown this picture before the picture of the origin evolution of the universe as it goes from 13.7 billion years ago all the way to the present day. And the story that we've learned through just observing the universe, the, the story has, in many ways, I think, the, 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 the feel of a, of, a, of a majestic myth, except that it has the benefit that it's quite likely to be true. It certainly has the impact of majestic myth, because 
As I said before, we know now the universe began 13.7 billion years ago. We know that from observing the way that distant galaxies recede away from other galaxies. And we know it from some data I'm going to show in a minute, from measuring something called the cosmic microwave background. We know that the universe expanded and cooled. And because we know the strength of gravity, we can turn that around and make an estimate of how long it took for the universe to cool such that gravity separated from the other forces of nature. So the picture again is that the four forces of nature today are really, as you go back in time, one force. And they've separated from each other as the universe expanded and cooled. We think gravity did that, something called the Planck time, 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the Big Bang. So we can even talk about time periods, that's point not, 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 43 noughts, one of a second after the universe began. And we can dare to think of the physics that was happening. We don't understand it very well, but at least we can put a, a number on it when gravity separated. We then have some evidence from the way that the, from the uniformity of the sky, from the fact the universe is the same in all directions, that there must have been something called an inflationary expansion which lasted actually from something like 10 to the minus 36 to 10 to the minus 32 seconds after the Big Bang. So that again, the tiniest time frame. But in that time, we think the universe expanded from something far smaller than a single electron to something about the size of this room, which was an immensely uh, far faster than light expansion in those very earliest times. Then the universe continued to expand and cool. After about a billionth of a second, the Higgs mechanism kicked in and broke something called electroweak symmetry. I've mentioned symmetries um, earlier on. That means that masses came into the universe for the first time. The Higgs particle did its work. This is the region, 10, well, what, here, about a billionth of a second after the Big Bang that we're exploring with the LHC. The universe then continued to expand and cool, and we get onto very firm ground because we've explored this area. We know that about a millionth of a second after the Big Bang, the universe was a soup of quarks and gluons called the quark-gluon plasma, and we can recreate that at the Large Hadron Collider by colliding nuclei of gold together with the machine. And we can rebuild this quark-gluon plasma when it was too hot for atomic nuclei to form, but you had this soup of massive atomic particles, subatomic particles. Then after about, well, from about up to about three minutes after the Big Bang, the universe continued to expand and cool. And after three minutes, it was cool enough for atomic nuclei to form. So the quarks and the gluons stuck together into the most basic of atomic elements, hydrogen, helium, a bit of deuterium, and a bit of lithium, actually in a particular ratio, which is a prediction of the Big Bang model, which is something like 75% hydrogen, 25% helium. And that's what we see in the universe today to a good approximation. So the constituents of the universe, mostly hydrogen, helium, was frozen in after about three minutes. Then expansion and cooling again. The next landmark is about 350,000 years after the Big Bang, when the universe became transparent to light for the first time. And this is where this incredible picture, this is one of the most remarkable pictures ever taken in the history of physics. Um, this is what that shows. See, when the universe became transparent, any photons of light that were around at that time could pass through the universe unimpeded and have been journeying from that time to us to this day. That's the time actually when electrons went into orbit around the hydrogen helium nuclei to form hydrogen and helium atoms. Uh, this is called the cosmic microwave background radiation. And so it's a picture of exactly what the universe was like 350,000 years after the Big Bang. George Smoot, who's one of the, 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 the fathers of this kind of physics, said, perhaps inappropriately in this building, but he said it, and it's true, he said it's like looking into the face of God. What he meant was that you are seeing the, 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 the earliest fingerprint of the creation of structure in the universe here, and it's quite remarkable. One thing is that it's about, well, you can see there, it's about 2.72 degrees above absolute zero. The red bits are hotter than the blue bits, and the difference in temperature is between 2.721 Kelvin, 2.721 degrees above absolute zero, and 2.729 Kelvin. So it's almost perfectly uniform apart from these tiny variations. These variations tell you virtually everything you need to know about the early universe. I haven't got, I could lecture for, 
10 hours about the information contained in this. Um, basically, you can see the seeds of galaxies here. You can see fluctuations that were slightly denser than other parts of the universe, which seeded the formation of galaxies. And actually, just one very interesting thing is if you look at it, there's some sort of characteristic size to these blobs, right? You can kind of see that it's, they're not completely random. They're all sort of roughly the same kind of size. That corresponds to sound waves in the early universe. So when the universe was a plasma, before the electrons went into orbit around the atoms, the, the sound could propagate through the universe, just like sound in an organ pipe. So you can see resonances, and you can see, um, you can infer the way that the, the, the universe evolved from that point, just from the way that, because you can see this sound frozen in, the, yeah, literally resonances. It's like you can hear an organ note and you can work out how big the organ pipe was. You can look at this and you can decompose it into its different notes and you can learn an immense amount about the early universe. It's quite an incredible picture. Then we carry on. We carry on from that point and after about, what, uh, a billion years, let's say, something like that, maybe a bit less, the first stars and galaxies formed around those density perturbations. And we can see the earliest stars to this day with the Hubble Space Telescope, which I think is quite remarkable. Stars called white dwarf stars. These are stars that are essentially long dead. So they were hot, they finished burning their fuel, their, their outer layers drifted off into space, and they've remained in our galaxy and in all the galaxies in the universe, cooling down ever since. And you can measure their temperature. It's these things here. And the brightness of these that the Hubble is seeing, they're about as bright as a, a candle on the surface of the moon. Right? And yet the Hubble can detect them. And you can work out how long it took them to cool down, and you find out they're something like 12 billion years old, and they're sat in our galaxy. They're incredible things for another reason. Um, this is, again, just another galaxy, one of those <laughs> average 100 billion stars floating around in the sky. Um, maybe. I don't know, 10 billion suns in the galactic core glowing that brightly. This is a star in that galaxy. It's on the outskirts of that galaxy, but it's a single star. It's actually a supernova explosion, but it's a very special supernova. It's to do with white dwarfs. This is a binary star system. So there's a, a white dwarf called a carbon oxygen dwarf, which is really literally a ball of carbon and oxygen. The star has cooked hydrogen into helium, and at the end of its life, it cooks helium and hydrogen into carbon and oxygen, some of the heavy elements that we need here on Earth for life. But they're locked away inside the star. But fortunately, this star, this white dwarf, had a companion star, which was big. And the white dwarf started to suck matter off the companion star. And when it gets to a particular density, a so-called critical mass, then it can no longer support itself and it explodes in a supernova explosion. At that point, this star glows as brightly as a billion suns for about two weeks, which is astonishing in itself. But it returns the carbon and oxygen and iron and it creates heavier elements in the explosion like gold and silver and returns those to the universe. When I say return, they appear in the universe for the first time in that process. So the heavy elements not hydrogen, helium, but everything else, are made in those explosions and returned into space. This is a beautiful picture of the Crab Nebula. This was an explosion that was seen on Earth, a supernova explosion, in 1054 AD. This star was only 6,000 light years away, so not in a distant galaxy. So you can imagine how bright it shone in the night sky. And this dust, this is, these are, the elements of life entering the universe for the first time, being returned to the universe to recollapse into new solar systems, places like the Earth. We know that it could be seen brightly in the sky because the Anastasi Indians saw it and painted it. So this is a wonderful picture, I think, of the, there's a moon, there's the artist's signature, and there's this new star that appeared in the sky for two weeks, 6,000 light years away, but glowing as brightly as the full moon. And those elements then condensed into, well, worlds like the Earth, no longer made of just hydrogen and helium, but because of supernova explosions and the, the stellar alchemy inside the cores of stars, a planet with a nitrogen atmosphere, which makes it blue, and with water and with carbon that can be the building blocks of life. Beautiful picture, which I never tire of showing. I think this is 
one of the most beautiful pictures of the Earth. This is the famous Apollo 8 picture taken on my first Christmas Eve, 1968, uh, by Apollo 8 as it went round the back of the moon. Um, it has great significance for many people. I've seen Al Gore give talks where he says that this picture, in his view, was the birth of the environmental movement because it was the, the first time that we saw the Earth hanging against the blackness of space. It's been described as the picture that saved 1968, you know, the near the height of the Vietnam War, the Paris, the student riots in Paris, and then this picture appeared on Christmas Eve and changed the way we look at our planet. I say one of the most beautiful pictures ever taken of the Earth. I think there are several more. This is an astonishing one that was taken very recently. It's astonishing because it's a picture of the Earth-Moon system, which I think is beautiful, the crescent Earth and the crescent Moon against space, taken from the orbit of Mars. So this was taken by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft, looking not down onto the Martian surface with its camera, but turning back to look at the Earth and the Moon. And then this picture, which many of you may have seen, one of the most, again, the most famous and beautiful pictures in the history of space exploration. This is a picture of Saturn taken by Cassini, which is still in orbit around Saturn. Um, it's a, it looks like computer graphic, but it's the, the, the rings of Saturn backlit by the sun. The most amazing thing about this picture is that little blob there, which I can fortunately blow up a little bit so you can see it. It looks like a moon suspended beneath the rings of Saturn, but actually it turns out that's planet Earth, which was captured in the frame from three quarters of a billion miles away. It's almost a single pixel in the picture. But even that is not the most distant picture of the Earth ever taken. I'm going to show you that in a moment, but I just, just a couple of weeks ago I got these pictures. They have nothing to do with the thread of the flow of this talk, but they're from Cassini. Um, so Cassini is in orbit around Saturn. A friend of mine works on the camera, and she sent me this, these two pictures. This one is a picture of the moon Enceladus, which is there, the crescent moon Enceladus. Uh, this is Saturn, which is actually in the background. And what you can see quite remarkably, if you've been watching my programs, you'll have seen the ice fountains of Enceladus, which are literally geysers of water spraying up and freezing as they leave the surface in fountains of ice thousands of kilometres high. And you can see them on, the, on the, the limb of Enceladus. This is an unprocessed picture. This is a black and white picture sent from Saturnian orbit with no processing. And then Cassini zoomed in underneath Enceladus and took this picture of the ice fountains. Enceladus is no bigger than Britain. It's about 500 kilometres in diameter, and yet it is active enough to have fountains of ice spraying from its surface. Back to the key point, though. <laughs> Pictures of a picture of me. Um, I, I put it there because this is a, the spacecraft that took the next picture. It's called the Voyager spacecraft, arguably the most successful machine we've ever built. It was launched in 1979. It is now 10 billion miles away from the sun. It's been flying through space since 1979. It visited Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune on its way. And it's no bigger than a, what, a car, almost. Can science deliver that emotional kick that we need? Right? Can these stories do it? Sagan expresses it better than most, I think. He says, consider again that dot. That's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being who has ever lived out their lives, the aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother, every father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, Every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species live there, on that moat of dust, suspended in a sunbeam, because that's a sunbeam, because the Earth is close to the sun at that point. He goes on to say, to me, well, there is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another, and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. I think it's a beautiful piece of writing. If you've never seen it or read it, I recommend it. It's an incredible story, I think. Um, and we have to remember 
that that story tells us how the building blocks of our planet were formed. Our planet was formed four and a half billion years ago. Billions is a word I've used a lot in this talk. It's almost impossible to picture billions of light years, billions of years. This is a wonderful way to picture it though. Only three and a half million years ago, one, one thousandth the age of the Earth, less than a thousandth the age of the Earth, there were no humans on the planet, but our distant ancestors left their footprints in the mudflats of Tanzania. And only three and a half million years later, right, a thousandth the age of the Earth, evolved to the point where we could lead a foot, lead a footprint on another world and build this astonishing civilization that can be seen from space, turn the darkness into night. Again, as the great Carl Sagan said, this is what hydrogen atoms can do when given 13.7 billion years. <laughs> <laughs> so I think for me, um, that expresses both things. I think science is clearly economically valuable and it's clearly spiritually valuable, if you want to use that word. I don't see why you need anything else, as Feynman said at the start. Um, let me finish with the words of, I think, someone who's rapidly becoming one of my heroes as I read more about him, the great scientist Sir Humphrey Davy, who, uh, well, worked throughout the 1700s. His great discovery, in his own words, his greatest discovery was Michael Faraday, who changed the way that we do business today, essentially, by... I suppose inventing electricity, if you want to put it like that. But what I think was interesting about Davy was that he was a great communicator of science, and he spent a lot of time, I think, under attack, justifying why we should do research. Now, it's unthinkable to think we would have stopped learning about the universe in 1780. I mean, what would we have lost? But you can tell that he had to defend his research time and time again against onslaught from polit political or religious leaders or whatever you want. Because he said this, he said, nothing is more fatal to the progress of the human mind than to presume that our views of science are ultimate, that our triumphs are complete, that there are no mysteries in nature, and that there are no new worlds to conquer. Thank you.